What's going on, y'all? Welcome in, welcome in. We're going to wait a little bit longer to get some more people in the in the live stream. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Kind of late notice. Let's see what we got going on. Okay. Yeah, we'll go with this. All right. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Hopefully your weekend was solid and being able to dodge these winter flurries. What's up, Aaron, man? Nice to nice to see you in here, bro. Uh, hopefully you're doing well. It's been a while past couple of days, obviously, with this football program. We're going to talk uh, some good stuff. So, all right, we got enough in here. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, make sure we got that. All right. There's been a lot of big time news for the Louisville Cardinals on the portal trail over the past couple of days, but perhaps the biggest news for the program is star edge rusher Ashton Gelati announcing that he is returning for his senior season. We're going to talk about how monumental that is. The Cardinals getting a commitment from Miami running back Don Chaney Jr. and more. So with that being said, let's get right on into the show. You are locked on Louisville. Your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville Podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. Want to take this time to personally thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Uh, just a reminder that the show is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team every day. As we mentioned on yesterday's show, this week is going to be catching up on the huge weekend that Jeff Brom had uh, for the Louisville Cardinals as it relates to the transfer portal. But uh, we're going to start out with the largest news of the offseason. That is star pass rusher Ashton Gelati announcing that he is returning. It's monumental for next year's team, and we're going to talk about that shortly. We'll also talk about the Cardinals getting a commitment from Miami running back Don Chaney Jr., and why that is intriguing. And then to conclude the show with the being a live episode, we will um, answer some questions in the mailbag. There are some that people have already sent in. If you have questions, be sure to drop them in the chat below. I'll be uh, sure to try to get to as many as possible in the time that we have allotted for it at the very end of the show. So be sure to send those questions in and we'll try to take the time to answer them. Thank you all for joining in to this live version of the show. So Let's get into it. The largest news for me, and this is really saying a lot because this past weekend was incredible. It felt like every time I blinked, there was Brady Brom sending out another tweet that another commitment was coming. And it sort of paralleled, if you remember that stretch back in 2021, when Pierce Clarkson committed to the program and... Following that, there were about, what, like seven to eight commitments in the span of 72 to 96 hours. It was unparalleled until potentially this past weekend where Louisville went on a run that was absolutely incredible. But, however, that is special. I will say the largest news that I took away from the past couple of days was Ashton Gelati returning. And this is no disrespect to uh, – okay, Jeremy, relax. If it isn't Dalton, I don't do live shows, Pence. I do it on special occasions, and this is a special occasion. Ashton Gelati is back. There were a ton of – well, not a ton. There were a couple of announcements that I was looking forward to. You know, Jamari Thrash, Jawar Jordan, both of those guys are going pro. Um, Isaac Garendo still yet to announce. Jarvis Brownlee. You would assume that Quincy Riley's going pro, although it hasn't been announced yet. But for me, and this is no disrespect to either of, or to any of those guys, but Gelati was the largest decision. It had the biggest impact because outside of quarterback, and you might be able to spin left tackle in this one, defensive end or edge rusher is a top three most important position on the football field because of the impact that it can have um, for the entirety of that side of the field. Like for instance, the defensive end, you have a star pass rusher. Well, that opens up a realm of possibilities for the opposite pass rusher, for the interior defensive lineman, for the linebackers. And it just, 
essentially is a trickle down effect that I feel like helps your defense and the long run from the front seven to the secondary. So, but Gelati is for me, one of those situations to where you expect a player all season long to turn pro that he's going to eventually go pro. You try to cherish the time that he's here while he's here. And I didn't see his draft stock rise, especially on mock drafts, big boards, didn't really see him much in the first three rounds. So by that Kentucky game, I'm thinking to myself, he's had a very, very solid season. I mean, he had 11 sacks in 2023, um, three forced fumbles, 45 total tackles, which is almost double than his previous career high. So all across the board, he took that step forward that a lot of people were expecting him to take, right? But I wasn't seeing the hype sort of build up with that. And I continually said throughout the year, look, the ACC is starting to give him a little bit more props, but make no mistake about it, Gelati is one of the most underrated players across the country. By almost every metric there is as it relates to pass rushing, Gelati is at least in the top five, um, especially in the conference, but also on the national stage as well. I'm not necessarily a too large of a fan of pro football focus PFF for short because I don't think it takes a lot of context into consideration but they do a good job when it comes to player grades at the college level and Gelati's player grade as a pass rusher was literally amongst the top of the country almost all season long and there really wasn't a stretch of the season where he wasn't fantastic I know early on in the year, maybe the quarterback pressures didn't turn into sacks, as my guy 55 alluded to early on in the season on the Cardinal Sports Zone podcast. Uh, but it started to trickle into that effect as the season went along. The sack numbers started to come along as well. So for me, I always expected him to essentially go pro. But for him to come back, don't let anyone undersell this move. This is a monumental move. It absolutely 100% hands down changes the ceiling of next year's team because you bring back, if you remember my top 15 most important players of the team heading into la into this past season, number one was Aston Gelati. And spoiler alert, he's going to be number one again it, before the 2024 year. And that is just a testament to how good he is. It's not every day that you return a player that had 11 sacks at the Power 5 level, and he showed that he grew as an overall defender. The tackle numbers grew as well. So what's going to happen in his senior season? Well, for me, I look at where the parallels could come from. I look at a guy I don't necessarily like to talk about the school down the road, but Josh Allen, for example. After his junior season, a lot of fans expected him to go to the NFL but he decided to bet on himself and return. And his senior season was one for the books. He ended up being a top, what, six pick in the following NFL draft. He was an absolutely um, incredible player on that Kentucky defensive line. Completely changed that whole dynamic of that defense and sort of masked over some of the deficiencies of that defense, but he was so good. And I don't know that Gelati rises into that much of a first round consideration, although he might, he definitely might, but I could still see him having that large of an impact on this line to where I have a ton of faith in guys like Mason Riger, uh, Adonijah Green that is rising up through the roster. Another player that Brom would have gone after had Jelotti not come back, but bringing Ashton back is absolutely incredible, and I think that it gives you the potential to have a defense that is better than this year's. Now, granted, the pass rush was pretty solid. I think looking at the roster from a roster standpoint, now, granted, you have to get better at defensive back because you still could potentially lose Quincy Riley. You could lose Jarvis Brownlee, but there is a potential that they do come back, although it might not necessarily be favorable odds. MJ Griffin is back off of a season-ending injury. The Cardinals definitely missed him this year. Um, they lose Cam Kelly and Storm Duck, but Devin Neal comes back. You're returning your linebacking core. You essentially return the entirety of your starting defensive line, which is huge um, outside of Stephen Heron. You bring in Thor Griffith, you bring in um, Jordan Gerard 
from Florida International and some other players. I think that this defense is going to be better for certain in 2024 with a senior-led Ashton Gelati. Um, I think that the sky is the limit. I think personally my prediction is he should have won it this year, but he didn't. He's going to win ACC Defensive Player of the Year in 2024. That is my hot, maybe not so hot prediction of the offseason defensively is that he will rack up those awards, and I think he's going to be a, a national All-American when it's said and done. Will he reach his 11 sack number from 2023? Mm, that is, that's a whole different story. So that's something that we're going to have to see if that comes to fruition. But he, if he gets back to double digits, I think that he is at the very least a day two draft pick um, in 2025. So this is the ultimate bet on yourself type move. I love this for Louisville. Obviously you get your best defensive player back, but I also like this for Ashton because I don't necessarily think that there was a ton of favor for him in draft circles in national media circles as well, when there definitely should have been. And I think that this gives him an opportunity to say, Hey, look, I'm that guy. I'm him. And I think he's going to put that on full display for the 2024 season. So that is the largest news of the offseason, no matter what happens in the portal, because you are bringing back a first team all ACC selection, potentially a preseason consensus all American. This is a, the gravity of this move cannot be understated. So definitely don't. Um, don't let anyone undersell this move because it is incredible. But as I mentioned, we're going to take the entirety of the week talking about the new commitments that Brom got over the weekend. Uh, one of them, Miami running back Don Chaney Jr. And this is a very interesting addition because there's one thing that worries me, but the potential is there. And we're going to talk about that. what that one thing is specifically here momentarily after we talk about our friends over at eBay Motors. Uh, passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy to keep your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay fit only available to U.S. customers. We mentioned that there's one thing that concerns me about Don Chaney. And for those who don't know who Don Chaney is, he uh, spent four years with the Miami Hurricanes. Um, this past season had a career high in rushing yards. He had 94 carries for 478 yards and two touchdowns. Um, he's just under 900 career yards with the Hurricanes from Homestead, Florida. So obviously, you know, Coach Jehova had a lot to do with this commitment. Um, but the storyline for Miami's running back committee this year was essentially that, that it was a committee. There were multiple players that had over 40 carries, um, you know, Mark Fletcher being one of them, tore up the Cardinals in that second-to-last regular season game. So Don Chaney, the main thing that worries me about Don Chaney is injuries. I talked to a couple Miami fans that I trust that um, will tell it to me straight and not sugarcoat it or, you know, be a sunshine pumper or a Debbie Downer or be bitter. They pretty much – came to a unanimous decision in saying that the thing about Cheney that held him back was strictly injuries because, frankly, the talent is there. I have seen him compared. Now, granted, you can say, well, this guy is the next so-and-so, and you have to really be careful there. But when I asked Miami, my Miami friend, who does John, Don Cheney's game resemble? The first name out of their mouth was Frank Gore. I said, well, that's pretty high praise. What, what's leading you to say that? The mix of size, speed, and agility. Don Chaney is 5'10", 210 pounds, so you're going to get a running back that is built similar to an Isaac Garendo, 
and um, has that rare blend of speed, that second level um, house call ability, and the strength and size to go with it. And when you watch the tape, when you watch the film, it's evident that when he's on the field, he is extremely solid. But as I say, I say, I said it one time, I said it a million times, the best ability is availability. And that does not matter whether it's football, basketball, baseball, soccer, tennis, lacrosse, badminton, uh, underwater basket weaving. You understand the point. Uh, you have to be available to play Don Chaney has had stints in his Miami career where he hasn't been able to stay on the field. So hopefully, like Tyler Shuck at the quarterback position, you are banking on a solid bill of health for Cheney. Now, looking at you know the eligibility aspect of this, you get that 2020 season, right? You get the 2020 season with the COVID year. I would expect he spent four years at Miami. I think, don't hold me to this, I think Cheney has two years of eligibility left should he want to use it. He has one for sure, and then he could probably apply for that medical red shirt and get it sort of like Isaac Garendo can with his sixth season. So needless to say, do I think Don Cheney is RB1? I don't know that yet. Does he have a Jawar Jordan-esque rise to stardom? If he's healthy, I think that there's definitely the opportunity. What we have to understand is it's all about projection. It's all about yards per carry for me. Cheney comes to Louisville with a 5.1 yards per carry um, you know, achievement over four years. I don't necessarily know if he's going to bust onto the scene like Jordan did, although it's possible. The yards per carry, the efficiency there is present. So it wouldn't be the most far-fetched idea to suggest, although I do think that the Cardinals are going to go by committee. And at this point, you look at where the roster is sitting. You have Don Chaney. You have Maurice Turner coming back for his redshirt sophomore season, who I think is in line for um, a little bit of bump in production. Kiwan Brown is going to be a redshirt freshman out of Atlanta. You have two very, very solid running back options in the 2024 class, Isaac Brown, the four-star running back from Miami has been getting a ton of glaring reviews about what he brings to the table. There's three-star, high three-star, low four-star running back Duke Watson from Georgia, who's also pretty solid. So right there, you have five running backs. Now the elephant in the room is whether or not Isaac Garendo is going to return. At this point in time, I haven't heard anything. So... Intuition speaking, this is not any inside information. My intuition is telling me I don't think he comes back. Just personally speaking, I thought we had a better chance at getting Jawar back than I, than Isaac. If Isaac comes back, I think that he has RB1 potential with Don Chaney. And you look at what Chaney's been able to do, like Garendo, and that's have some big-time games. Chaney had 12 for 85 against Florida State. Back in November, he had 24 for 106 against Georgia Tech. Um, didn't really get a ton of snaps this season. He had 94 carries. Granted, this is a situation where Miami really, really uh, deviated the snaps in that backfield. So you have to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. I think he's an RB1 candidate is where I'm trying to get it. I'm not sure that they add another player outside of maybe maybe Jalen Lucas, who I think is more so an all-purpose back rather than a traditional running back. So if you're going to sit here and tell me that Don Chaney's RB1 and Maurice Turner's the immediate backup, I can convince myself that that's okay. Because it's not a testament as to whether or not Chaney can be RB1. It's a matter of whether he's going to be healthy enough across the duration of the season to where if he's getting these snaps, if they are calling his number the majority of the time in the game. And we saw this past year that Jawar got the majority of the carries, but it wasn't like a, a staggering differentiation in snaps. Like it, it was pretty healthy in terms of workload, right? Um, if he's getting the majority of the snaps, there's going to be an increased opportunity for him to sustain an injury. The shelf life for running backs is 
probably the lowest of any position in the NFL because of the wear and tear on the body. So I would be lying if I said that there wasn't at least a little bit of concern for a player with injury history at the running back position. But I also can't deny that the talent is there. And if Don Chaney is on the field healthy, good things will happen for the Cardinals. But even better, or it maybe offers you a little bit of comfort uh, on the back end, I think that even if Chaney does get hurt, I think Maurice Turner is a potential star in the making. He gives me Jawar Jordan early in his global career vibes. And then you've got Kiwan Brown, who has shown that he can play well against Murray State. Whether or not that's going to translate, we'll see. And then you've got two very talented freshmen. And if you get Jalen Lucas, well, you have another player that can rise into that spot. So we will see. I think that adding a guy like Don Chaney, yes, the elephant in the room is availability. Can he stay healthy? But from a talent perspective, no one should be uh, debating this because he could definitely come in. Could he be in a thousand yard receiver or rusher? TBD. We'll see. But nonetheless, I like the move. I like that you're going back down to South Florida and getting a player from that area and continuing that pipeline. So shout out to Coach Hova, Jeff Brom, the Flyville guys, etc. So, excuse me, I've got the hiccups. The final segment of the show dedicated to the weekly mailbag. So I'm going to take some time to answer some questions that you all have to ask. Be sure to drop some questions in the YouTube comments below. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, before we get into that mailbag, I do want to thank you all again for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Global Podcast is free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, obviously, if you are watching this on the live format. So Monday mailbag, we haven't had a live Monday mailbag yet in the history of Locked On Louisville, so it is a first for everything. Let's answer some questions. Aaron Walker asks, are we completely out on DJU? I keep seeing our name associated with him. Thanks for the question, Aaron. I do think that we are out on DJU. I'm not necessarily so sure that we were ever truly in serious consideration, despite there being social media posts suggesting the contrary. Um, let me preface all this by saying that I don't think Louisville adds another starting level quarterback. I think Tyler Shuck is the guy on paper for 2024. Take that for what you will, but I think that, I would be very, very surprised at this point if the Cardinals go with another quarterback. Awesome Lawson mentions Cam Ward. That obviously applies to this recruitment as well. Moving on down, um, let's see. Aaron asks again, does Isaiah Cummings play a decent role next year? I think he's tied in three. Um, from maybe an on-field perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense statistically. Although maybe, you know, with how Jeff Brom utilized Joey Gatewood, maybe that's the same formula for Isaiah Cummings trying to utilize his size, especially in the red zone, maybe trying to get a mismatch on linebackers. But I think that he's going to be behind Mark Redman, Tanner Koziel, depending on Nate Kariski and Jamari Johnson. We'll see, but I don't necessarily think that he plays too large of a role next year, but we will see. Uh, Babu says, is the latest Brady bomb from tonight, Lucas from IU? I think he would be one of the candidates for sure. I think some other players to look out for, maybe the Monroe Mills guy from Texas Tech is another player to keep an eye on. Jalen Lucas, those two, by process of elimination, uh, would be two that I would probably keep an eye out on at this point. Let's see. Dalton, any word on Jamari Johnson's status and how he is coming along? Really hoping he isn't going to transfer with all the tight ends coming in. I'll be honest, if there was a player that would transfer out, I could see it being either Nate Kariski or Jamari Johnson. Unfortunately, like I said, that's sort of the drawback to the portal is that the portal giveth, the portal taketh away. So, um, it is what it is. He hasn't really seen much of the field, which, I mean, he was a true freshman last year. I think that it's really too early to tell. Um, it's not ideal, but it's too early to tell. If we are at this point in July and August where we're not hearing his name all that much, then I think that there is a legitimate conversation to have about whether or not he could be a portal candidate if he's not already. We talked about Cam Ward. Jay Wright rumors. 
I mean, it seems like a pipe dream at this point, right? Um, assuming that this is Kenny's last year, which it seems like the writing is on the wall, um, but nothing is official at this point. Let's play the hypothetical game that Kenny Payne is not here for year three. I feel like Jay Wright has always been a pipe dream that we try to convince ourselves is an option. Now, granted, I will say that his reaction and his body language to them mentioning that he's fielding job offers um, on that tribute to Dickie V on, um, I think it was, was it CBS or TBS, one of the two. I found the body language to be very interesting. It felt, now obviously I might be reading too much into this, it almost like felt like it was like awkward vibes. Like, <laughs> yeah, guys, go ahead and stop it. But meanwhile, you're like, damn. I wouldn't. I wouldn't surprise me if Jay Wright has gotten a dozen calls saying, hey, man, uh, you miss coaching yet? You want to come back into coaching? I could definitely see that happening. Is Louisville a program that would make sense for Jay Wright? I mean, yeah, but how – I understand the um, – awesome. you bring up a good point. Awesome Lawson brings up a good point that he is close to Josh Hurd. Yes, so I understand where the, um, where the connection is. I'm just not necessarily sure – if it's going to happen, because look, Billy Donovan's name, Billy Donovan's name has been thrown out there for 10 years. Brad Stevens name has been thrown out there for over 10 years. Now, granted, a little bit different situation, right? But I, I, I don't know. I'm going to have, it's one of those, I'll see it when I believe it type moments. Um, for those just tuning in, we are in the mailbag segment of the show. So any questions you all have, be sure to ask away. We'll answer a couple more um, to conclude the show. Uh, Babu asks again, who is the biggest need in the portal right now? Um, I assume meaning uh, position needs. It is defensive backs at the moment because that could change if you were to bring back Quincy Riley and or Jarvis Brownlee. At this point, I think there's a potential to get one of them back. There's potential to get both of them back. I don't think it's set in stone that either of them is set on going to the league. It definitely is a decision for both of them. Let me make that clear is that if you think that it is already a done deal that they're going to the league, think again because it is definitely not. Um, there are decisions to be made. Now, whether they are leaning on coming back or going pro, I have no clue there. I think it's probably 50-50 for both. Um, at the moment, on paper, defensive back is the true need. Now, granted, you added um, Thornton from Central Florida. You added uh, Darren Ruffin, the Trinity guy at safety for depth. So that helps out a little bit, but I still think that depending on the status of the two starters, you could need to add some starters to the mix. Um, let's see. Aaron asks, potentially will next year's team be the best team talent wise we have ever fielded? I mean, talent wise, it's hard to argue with those Charlie strong teams. Those are some really, really talented teams. Um, I really, 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 really wish that we could have that team in 2024 with the 12 team playoff and see how they would, um, you know, line up with some of these other teams. So I don't necessarily know that pound for pound they're going to be the most talented, but they're definitely going to be up there. So, um, awesome, awesome. A couple questions. If not, Jay Wright, what is your top three candidates looking like? Obviously, Kenny Payne's still the coach, so don't want to discuss too much about this. But if Louisville were to make a move, I would assume that they're going to look at a guy like Kansas State's Jerome Tang. I assume that there will have conversations with Dusty May from Florida Atlantic. Shaka Smart will obviously get a call from Marquette. Potentially Jay Wright as well. Um, some bigger fish that they might be able to sway. Maybe Scott Drew at a place like Baylor, although it is questionable what the fit looks like there. I don't think Eric Musselman leaves Arkansas. As much as people say it, that buyout with Mick Cronin is just the elephant in the room. So would Cronin succeed here? Sure. Is it plausible? I'm not sure that it is financially. So over under, Kenny Payne is fired after the UK game. Dude, if you know, you you know as much as I do. Um, personally, it felt like the writing was on the wall for maybe there had been a move this past weekend. There ended up not being one. And it seems like everybody hears something from someone that they trust. And this is no, I'm not sending shots at all here to anyone. 
I think I'm more so highlighting that no one has any clue. And you're not truly going to have any clue until an athletic board meeting is scheduled. And at that point, obviously, you're going to have um, you're going to have the the signs there. So uh, any final questions you all have uh, for me in this in this live mailbag session? Thanks again, y'all, for tuning in uh, to this live version of the show. It's pretty late notice, but definitely like to do these. So um, definitely get any final questions that you all have in. Um, be sure to follow the show on all streaming services. Subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe to the podcast Twitter page, etc. There was one question um, that someone sent in before the show. It was related to injury. Um, issues with JJ trainer and Dennis Evans. I don't have any status on either one of those truthfully. Um, obviously don't think it's ideal that they're not playing. It would suggest that it is sort of a lingering issue, but I, I don't know any specifics at this point. And in turn, I don't necessarily know how long they're going to be out. So only thing you hope for is that they, um, you know, return sooner rather than later. So we will see, but Thanks again, everyone, for the questions, for tuning into the live version of the show. Um, I appreciate um, all the support and more on the next couple episodes. We're talking about the local guys that have committed, Isaiah Cummings and uh, Darren Ruff, and we're talking about the offensive linemen that committed, defensive linemen, cornerback. There's a ton of commitments to talk about. It's not my fault that Jeff Brom went full scorched earth in the portal this past weekend. I can only do so much with 30 minutes. So I appreciate you all tuning in. Everyone have a great day. Who knows? Might have a live episode tomorrow. So be sure to stay tuned. Go Cards.